Okay, so hi, my name is Maria Ruggieri and I'm a PhD student at USC. And I study these anemones right here, um, specifically thermal tolerance. So I just wanna start by talking about my journey of how I got to where I am. So I grew up on the coast of New Jersey. So here's me right here on the beach. Uh, my whole childhood, um, I pretty much spent out on the beach digging up sand crabs. Uh, I got interested really early on in marine life, but I had no idea that this could ever turn into a career. So when I went to go off to college, I was actually choosing between uh, going to New York for art school and going to the University of Miami to study psychology. and. I didn't really realize it at the time, but it became clear to me that I chose the University of Miami because it was so close to the ocean. I could go out year round and snorkel on the reefs and uh, really just get immersed in marine life. However, I did take a year to study psychology there. And during my summer break, I decided to work at a marine science camp. Um, so we taught kids about marine biology and conservation. And they really just asked the most interesting questions. And that really inspired me to, okay, I'm very interested in this subject and I want to continue learning about it. So I went back to Miami and I switched my major to marine biology. And I started working in a lab there. So this is me um, snorkeling. And my project was to do fish surveys in mangrove habitats. And I wanted to compare the habitat value of natural um, mangroves to man-made structures like docks and seawalls. And while I was in this lab, I also got experience doing coral restoration. So Corals form the foundation for coral reefs worldwide, but they're threatened due to climate change and other um, human-induced stressors. So I really got interested in that ecosystem and protecting it, which brings me to this anemone, which I will talk about um, today. So I study the aggregating anemone, Anthopora elegantissima. Um, this anemone lives in the intertidal zone along the coast of California. So the intertidal is an extremely dynamic habitat. So during low tides, they'll be exposed and you may have seen them, they kind of just look all shriveled up. Um, when they're underwater, they, they look more like flowers. Um, but what's really interesting about these is they reproduce both sexually and asexually. So here is one reproducing asexually. So it splits into two genetically identical clonal individuals. And they'll just keep doing this until they form really large aggregations in the intertidal. So here's one with over 100 individuals. But perhaps the most interesting thing that really led me to this system is that they have symbiotic algae that lives within them. So symbiosis in this case is a mutually beneficial relationship between an animal host and a microscopic algal symbiont. And the anemone basically provides shelter and nutrients to the symbiont. And in return, like plants, the symbiont photosynthesizes and gives sugars to the host, which it can use for energy. However, under stressful conditions, this relationship breaks down um, in a process known as bleaching. So this results in a loss of the algal symbionts or reduction in their photosynthetic pigments. Um, and in corals, uh, this is a really well-characterized response and it occurs only one or two degrees Celsius above the average temperature. And when this happens, the coral animal actually cannot live without the algae. So 
there have been widespread declines in corals worldwide um, due to increasing sea surface temperatures. In contrast, the anemone I'm studying actually withstands temperature fluctuations of up to 20 degrees Celsius when it's exposed during low tide. So I'm interested in the genetic and environmental effects that might lead to increased thermal tolerance in this anemone. And to do that, I'll be making two main comparisons. So one is between the high and low intertidal. So as you go up higher in the intertidal, organisms are exposed more during low tides, which leaves them vulnerable to higher temperatures and other abiotic stressors. Whereas if you're lower in the intertidal, you're not getting exposed as much and they're in a more constant environment. So I hypothesize that anemones from the higher intertidal might be more thermally tolerant than ones in the low intertidal. And this could be due to either selection for more heat tolerant genes, or it could just be because they're preconditioned to these um, environments and they can anticipate this increase in temperature during low tide. The other comparison is on the inside and outside of aggregation. So as I mentioned earlier, within an aggregation, these are all genetically identical clonal organisms. But one study found that the anemones on the outside of the aggregations get heated up more during low tide than the ones on the inside. So the ones on the inside might be getting buffered um, from the environment. So I'm interested in looking if there could be differences in thermal tolerance, not due to any genetic differences, but solely due to recent environmental history that these anemones have experienced. So the first thing that I had to do was take these anemones and expose them to different temperatures to figure out what temperature it, we are gonna see bleaching. So um, here I measured chlorophyll, which is a photosynthetic pigment, and then tested it across five different temperatures with 18 being this control temperature. And as you can see, what we expected was that chlorophyll decreases with increasing temperatures. And what's really cool is that you can see this visually. So up here, here's an anemone with its symbionts, and down here is one that has lost its symbionts and is now bleached. Um, but what I was really interested in getting out of this was at what temperature are we gonna see variation between the high and low intertidal organisms? So I further split this up. This is the same plot, but split up into one sampled from the low intertidal in blue and one's from the high intertidal in pink. And this response is actually exactly opposite of what I hypothesized. So ones in the low intertidal are retaining more, more chlorophyll than ones in the high intertidal. So they're bleaching less. Um, and at first I wasn't sure why this is, but one thing that's important to note is this was after one month of acclimation in the lab to this controlled temperature. So they were submerged at this um, controlled temperature, which is more similar to the environment that the low intertidal anemones would be experiencing. So it could be that the ones from the low um, performed better because they had been kept for a month in an environment more similar to, um, to the one they typically experience. So I repeated this experiment um, with only a 10 day acclimation period. So just giving them a little time in the lab to, um, to acclimate and then doing the thermal stress. And then I measured photosynthesis and respiration. So what I do is incubate the anemones in these little chambers seen on the top, and then measure the change in oxygen. So when I do these incubations during the day, there's an increase in oxygen due to the algal symbiont photosynthesizing. 
And then if I do these incubations again at night, there's a decrease in oxygen because the, the symbiont will not be photosynthesizing and we can get respiration of the anemone itself. Then what I do is calculate a ratio, so photosynthesis to respiration. And this gives us a metric of how productive this relationship is. So if it was at one, that means that all the energy that's being produced by photosynthesis is being used towards respiration. So there's no net gain in energy. But if it's above one, then there probably is some net benefit that the host is getting from the symbiont. And what you see here is after this just short-term acclimation period, we see what we originally expected. So anemones from the high intertidal are not bleaching as much as ones from the low intertidal where you see this drastic decrease in this ratio. And then I also did this for anemones on the inside and outside of aggregations. And this is also consistent with what I hypothesized that ones on the inside of aggregations would bleach more. However, what's interesting here is that anemones on the outside in control conditions seem to just be less productive than the ones on the inside, despite um, not having a heat stress. So that could be because this was these were sampled at peak summer temperatures, so they were already bleached, or we might also observe this across the year. Um, no matter what temperature. So my plan was to repeat this this summer um, with larger sample sizes. So everything I've shown so far um, is just with a few different aggregations. So including more aggregations to see if these patterns are consistent. However, um, most of the summer plans have been postponed. So I will now be running this experiment in the fall. And what I'll be doing is sampling anemones from the inside and outside of aggregations, exposing them to a thermal stress, and then measuring uh, traits associated with bleaching. Like I mentioned before, chlorophyll, photosynthesis to respiration ratios, um, as well as I'll also be sequencing and genotyping the anemone host and its symbiont to see um, what the symbiont community looks like within each host. And then if I can, I will also be running a longer term acclimation to see if we keep these anemones in, in these control conditions like we saw in the first um, plot, if we get the same response um, where after the low intertidal anemones are acclimated, to conditions similar to their home environment, we see this change in which is more thermally tolerant. Um, so I just wanna end with uh, this plot, which kind of drives home the main, um, main ideas behind my research. So if you were to just go into the, um, field and sample anemones, you might see this range of thermal tolerance over here. And this could be due to a variety of factors. So it could be due to genetic effects, like having more or less heat tolerant alleles, plastic effects, like being preconditioned uh, to higher temperatures, or symbiont effects as well. So if the symbiont is more or less thermally tolerant, it's going to affect the response you see um, in the host. And so this is to predict how symbiotic organisms might adapt to rising ocean temperatures um, and identify possible intervention strategies. So if there's a genetic basis, you could invest more time and money into selectively breeding heat tolerant corals. But if you can increase thermal tolerance by preconditioning, then you can um, manipulate corals, bring them into the lab, precondition them, and hopefully they will be able to survive increasing sea surface temperatures. 
And that goes along with management as well. So um, depending on what is the main effect, you might want to protect populations that seem to have um, more heat tolerant alleles or protect populations that you know have the thermal environment that's going to promote higher thermal tolerance. So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge my PI, Carly Kinkel, um, Connie and Wyatt, who are my lab mates who helped me out, and then Kelly and the rest of the Wrigley staff.